Uh, thanks, David. Appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, it's an honor to be able to speak to everybody today uh, at the Sapphire Hypergrowth Summit. Um, to introduce myself, I, I'm one of the co-founders of Gradient, and we are in the business of enterprise AI automation. So uh, what we really do believe is the future of automation will be autonomous. And uh, how many of you have ChatGPT uh, on your phone or on mobile right now? Now, I want to use that in how you experience that, applica that application and contrast that with how agents work. So what you'll notice about chatbots, which are the, fun the main application of generative AI today, is the fact that the experience is synchronous and it's optimized for answering your question. Now, on the other side of things, how agents work are that they work asynchronously to execute plans and they also are optimized to complete goals and tasks. So they're a little bit more adept for enterprise workloads. Over here, I wanted to show what's probably one of the more standard modern agent system architectures out there. Um, the main thing that you should understand about that is every part of the components is to augment the action space of the agent. So the action space basically is the agent's ability to talk to applications, work with the environment that it's in, and then integrate it with all the systems that you want to endow it with. So a lot of what we do in developing agent systems is to bring about the memory components and the tools in order to augment that action space and increase its capabilities. This is similar to how human beings interact with their environment, and we actually augment the way that we can uh, make actions upon our environment. I think we are in a why now moment with respect to agents, and we're gonna see the proliferation of them within companies, within other use cases, all over the place. The three fundamental technologies that have led us up to this point uh, are the stronger foundational models that are better at reasoning and planning, the faster, cheaper, more economical inference that allows for more agent chaining, and then a disruption in the database space with vector databases which enable you to have stronger long-term memory external knowledge additional to the agent. I preface by saying there's the fourth component which I fundamentally believe will change the way that we uh, have experiences for agents and unlock all new applications and that is long context. Now, the main pitfalls of agents and why we don't see them everywhere today is the fact that Prior to this year, most models could only handle a pretty finite amount of context, and the two main components of these errors uh, are the following. First, it comes with the memory management of the system. So everybody uses some sort of retrieval system to manage and synthesize the memory, and also having to assemble the vectors of the memory storage mechanisms for the context that you provide the agent. The additional aspect is, if you've ever noticed in, when you want to play with uh, certain chatbots or you want to give them ambiguous actions, it becomes harder for them to actually do what you want them to do. And that's because agents need to be able to break down these plans and chain all of the actions together and the tasks in order to uh, facilitate these workflows. Now, long context models resolve and mitigate these pitfalls because, for one, if you add many, many shots into the context of the model, you reduce its sensitivity to sample selection. So a lot of times, a lot of these models are extremely sample efficient. So being able to just provide more and more samples allows for it to figure out the decision boundary. Now, the additional aspect on the vague instruction following is similar to what you would do when you're hiring an intern or you're working with them. You break down the instructions, you articulate the instructions more, and you enable it the best chance it can get to be able to execute on the plans that you provide. I wanted to go into a few uh, specific advantages and examples that uh, just one of many in which you can leverage these long context models. In terms of the first, if anybody has looked at the system prompt uh, for Claude or the system prompt for GPT-4, it is extremely long. It's far longer than it's ever been back in the day, mostly because of having longer, uh, uh, more tokens being provided to the model. You're able to uh, improve the steerability and the alignment of that model to follow the instructions that you give it. 
Additional to that, a use case that you will see uh, recently in this research paper is providing thousands of many-shot examples for a multimodal classification task. So by providing thousands of images paired with the uh, labels for the text, it was able to improve the accuracy significantly merely by leveraging all of that context. So why aren't, long co uh, why aren't long context models everywhere? Why aren't all the model providers trying to train these models? Well, at Gradient, we actually did go through the lessons learned and we actually did facilitate uh, long context, a series of long context models to the open source. Uh, the two main challenges that I'll explain to you are first, the need for extremely large VRAN because of the attention mechanism, and then second, the fact that even if you pass the correct tokens into the model, if it can't leverage and it sees them as out of distribution, it won't be able to predict the next token because models are trained to predict the next token. So in, in approaching the very first challenge, uh, I'll introduce the concept of ring attention. So bear with me. Uh, as I explain how ring attention works. So the attention mechanism is quadratic. I think that's well known. Now with ring attention, what you do is you create blockwise parallel transformers and you don't need to materialize the softmax into memory uh, up front. So what you do instead is you break up uh, the attention mechanism into this network, this ring network topology, and then you pass around and accumulate the KV values across that ring topology to calculate the entire attention. Now, this helps facilitate longer sequence lengths within the ability of the forward pass for the model. In the original large world model paper, we estimate that the cost of that training was approximately $400,000 uh, for their particular seven billion parameter model. That's a bit expensive for us, so uh, what we did is we used a hierarchical weight sharding mechanism for the attention layer. So what, uh, what we actually did is we created sub-ring network topologies within the training of the ring attention, so we had redundant cache of the attention mechanism per subring, and we traded off the memory in order to reduce the bandwidth uh, bottleneck of the training. So in most multi-node training scenarios, even with ring attention, the main bottleneck will be balancing between the flops and the memory bandwidth. And in our case, it mirrors a lot how uh, if anybody's sort of heard of striped or striped attention or hyena attention, uh, using that mechanism to have a little bit of redundancy in the cache enabled us to get a 10x increase in the uh, token throughput for our training of these long context models. Now to address the second uh, challenge for building these models, uh, we have to address how to make the model actually attend to the tokens. So if you have ever looked at positional encodings for uh, large language models, it's, it follows a sinusoidal pattern and this period periodicity is governed by this theta value within the, uh, within the positional encoding. And by increasing the theta value and running an, uh, a bunch of uh, empirical experiments, we found that if we stretch out the length of the period, we can keep most of the positions in context for the model when we add more and more tokens to the training. So we took a curriculum learning approach and then we progressively increased the context length of that model. On the right side in that diagram, you can imagine that is a, this is a geometric uh, interpretation of what we did where we are stretching out that, that amplitude and the frequency for being able to have the positional encodings. So even though we built these models, what we really were only doing is we're improving the model's ability to protect the next token. A lot of the capabilities of these models when you're actually extending the context length aren't well known ahead of time, so you have to evaluate the emergent capabilities somehow. Uh, I argue that there's three main sources and categories of evaluations you should look at. The first being like the primitives, the ability to actually attend to tokens, retrieve and, and find context. The next is a little bit more nuanced where you leverage the entirety of the context and you do more of a style transfer evaluation. And finally, 
end-to-end -end agent workflow evaluations is, is, is the new state of the art in what everybody is sort of moving towards. So the very first evaluation that we tried after we trained these models was the needle in the haystack evaluation that's really well known. That's basically a pass key retrieval benchmark. And what you do is you give the mod, you throw a key and a value into a pool of tokens and make the model complete the value after you prompt it, for the, uh, you prompt it with a key. The other more, uh, the more uh, sophisticated suite of benchmarks that are uh, called Ruler from NVIDIA, they, what they test is they include both the needle and the haystack suite of benchmarks as well as a variable tracking benchmark that is multi-hop. So you're basically trying to find the state and track state across all the tokens. You also are trying an aggregation evaluation in which you're kind of counting how many times a variable is occurring or you're doing sums on top of it. And then finally, a distraction question answer evaluation where you, you try to distract the language model. So if you ever notice sometimes, particularly for RAG, when you give the language model some context or something that's irrelevant, it just really can't pay attention to what you want it to do. So that evaluation tests that capability and its ability to focus. If I move on to the tasks such as style transfer, we did an internal benchmark that was pretty interesting and a little bit fun. So what we did is we progressively passed more tokens into our model, uh, and these were all Mark Twain novels. So we progressively passed more and more Mark Twain novels and made the model create a short story uh, in the voice of whatever context they're given. We masked the fact that it is a Mark Twain, it, Mark Twain was the author, and also masked some of the other aspects in terms of the name of the book. We passed and made Claude, GPT-4, and other uh, closed source models compare the outputs between the two progressively uh, longer context generations. And in th those evaluations, we found that uh, the longer context, uh, the more context you provided, the more stylistically accurate the short story became, became uh, towards uh, mirroring Mark Twain's uh, voice and mirroring his, his writing. So moving past the style transfer aspect evaluations, we're starting to move on to the frontier evaluations, which I would categorize uh, in a new concept called an evolutionary benchmark. So if anybody's seen Devin, um, all the metrics for Devin involved this benchmark called SWE Bench. Uh, the main concept about that is the fact that these agents in SWE Bench has to keep track of two different types of state. So a pull request is actually an evolutionary style of evaluation because it needs to have an effect on the repository afterwards. And you can evaluate the different turns of actions that the agent is having on the context and the state of whatever environment it's having. So these are more in the sense of the new age benchmarks that we should be running for these. I'll just go through this table really quickly, summarizing a few of the use cases and where you want to use uh, the different classes of models. But the main focus here will be on the 70 billion parameter model for the coding agents. And uh, what you really need those for are the very complex tasks. And being able to provide all that context there will improve your ability to create new experiences and new, new use cases. So in sort of being able to transition over towards what does this all mean? So um, internally as a company, what we do is we automate a lot of processes. And my engineers actually leverage an internal multi-agent framework to help do some of the work that they uh, have to build these solutions for and build solutions for customers. So in the case of short context lengths, what will you have to do to be able to facilitate this multi-agent system? Well, on the coding agent side, when you're traversing documents, when you're, when you're making actions that error out, and when you are having multiple turns of action, you have to synthesize all the information if it doesn't fit in the context of the model. Now that's really lossy. In addition to that, what else would you probably have to do? You either have to create a hier hierarchical structure for the retrieval aspect of things, where you link together different uh, highly correlated pieces of context, or, what I would argue you, sh you should instead do is to leverage the context, the entire context of a long context model and use an append-only structure. So imagine, and, and I'll propose a use case where you have all of your stack traces, 
that are evolving and then you store those in an appended uh, piece of prompt or text. You have all the documentation you need and you also have all the turns of actions that the agent is actually uh, uh, performing on top of the environment. You can pass that all back into the planning agent for an evaluation process and using well-known techniques such as self-correction or reflection to figure out whether or not the, the task has been accomplished or to generate a new plan. So, I mean, despite the use cases that are possible with respect to these agents, there are still a lot of open problems and challenges to making this possible, and that mainly is governed around hosting these models. So, in particular, the three main areas that provide, that raise a lot of challenges are the fact that latency is a concern for some folks, and you have the load balancing aspect of being able to control for all that memory, and also just the memory constraints. And on that side of things, you can address those. You can use optimized kernels and context caching uh, and more intelligent batching algorithms as well as, uh, like I had previously talked about, ring attention. So I, I hope you've sort of learned a little bit more about in particular, how to build these long context models, how you want to approach evaluating them, and the new use cases, and uh, how agents can truly leverage these new capabilities to uh, bring on and onboard new experiences.